think uh, we can start now uh, with our first infra talk in 2022. So warm welcome to, the, uh, to today's talk from Consort SVD on data dissemination, web findability and open data format. The infra talks are an opportunity for all consortia to, uh, to present relevant topics, not only within the NFDI community, but also to everybody via YouTube. Uh, so therefore our usual disclaimer, this talk and the discussion um, are being recorded and there's a live stream uh, which just started on YouTube. So uh, please turn off your camera in case you don't want to be recorded. And as usual, please also mute yourself. In case you want to participate in the discussion, please uh, simply type a Q in the chat section. And in case you want to contribute to the discussion but don't want to be recorded, you can also type down your question, of course. Today's talk is presented by Brigitte Matiak, Claudia Saalbach, and Xiao Yao Han. I hope that I somehow got uh, the somehow right pronunciation of your name, and please apologize um, that I'm not that familiar with your name, but I'm eager to learn. Um, all three presenters are from Concert SVD. Uh, some words on each presenter. Um, Brigitte Matiak is the head of the data center for the humanities. And since 2015, she is a junior professor at, of digital humanities at the University of Cologne. Claudia Saalbach is a research associate in the data operation and research data center at the SEP, the socioeconomic panel, which is located at the German Institute for Economic Research, um, DEV Berlin. And Xiao Yao Han is a research associate in the same section uh, at the SERP. Today's talk has two parts. In the beginning, we will get an insight into results of a study which was conducted at Concert SVD, uh, which examined the findability of research data at Concert SVD. And the second half concentrates uh, more on a metadata enriched open data format, which was developed in a project. And um, because this format is easily accessible, readable and interoperable in various statistical software, it can reduce obstacles for replication studies and uh, therefore it's highly relevant, of course, also in general for research data. So um, I would suggest that I uh, hand over. I assume, uh, Brigitte Matiak, you will start. OK, perfect. So, yes. please go. so I've already uh, shared the slides. I hope everybody can see that and hear me fine. Excellent. OK, first little correction. Uh, so yeah, I have been the speaker of the DCH and also uh, have been at the University of Cologne. But I am, that is actually old news. So I, in 2021, I switched to Gazes and uh, I'm very happy there. So this is how I, I come to be with Concert SPT. And, okay, please yeah. accept my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's okay. I, I think we still need to uh, update the website. So. Okay, so uh, two topics today, findability um, and open data format. And uh, again, thank you for the <laughs> introduction. Uh, everything else, as far as I know, is absolutely correct. Um, okay, let's uh, start with a brief introduction, what I mean when I talk about findability. Uh, you all probably heard about findability when it comes to the FAIR principles, uh, the first one, the F. Um, but what makes findability so interesting uh, when, we come, when we talk about research data? Uh, first of all, research data is much harder to find on the web than literature references. Everyone who has ever searched for um, research data has experienced that, and we have ample uh, surveys and similar sources to, to collaborate that. Uh, so it's not only your feeling that it's actually harder to, to do that, um, it's, it's what everybody feels. And why is that? Uh, one reason is that data needs are much more specific. So you need specific data, you need uh, specific circumstances, 
uh, you have needed in a certain format and so on and so forth. So that makes it harder to find because it's not like uh, literature where you just need some things that somehow matches what you're trying to look for, but you need something that's uh, a lot more that has to fit into what you're already doing in uh, many more ways. And, and the other thing is that uh, data sources are much more heterogeneous. Um, there are more data repositories out there. Um, there are fewer large metadata repositories that you can use to just access everything. Um, so yeah, um, that is the state finding data is much harder. So how can we improve that? Um, well, our goal uh, of, the, of the measure is to improve the findability and by that reuse of consolidated metadata and data, of course. Um, and uh, for that, we uh, provide metadata in common web format, for example, schema.org, Dublin Core, et cetera. And um, what we also do is appropriate uh, SEO measures. So uh, SEO stands for search engine optimization. That's exactly what you now think. This is about increasing your ranking with Google. <laughs> But we also need other things, for example, high quality and rich metadata. Uh, what's our current approach in the measure? Uh, we are modeling data search because data search is a little under research, especially if you compare it to literature search. Uh, we don't really know how everything works. So we have made some headway in that and I will present that here. Uh, we have observed social scientists. We uh, did a survey and interviews uh, with uh, the concert SVD participants. I uh, will present some results from the survey here. And we also develop hands-on recommendations on how to improve this policy. Usually I would say, oh, you can read all that in our report, but unfortunately <laughs> it's not published yet. So maybe you can read it in our report uh, next week. Or if you're with concert SVD, you can also already read it because we already have uh, published it internally. So uh, how do I start uh, with, with modeling? So this is the model that we currently use. We have one person in the middle who has some sort of data set need. And then uh, when we look at, at, uh, uh, at the literature, we can see um, that uh, that person will go and try to find hints on how to solve that need uh, within the literature, within their personal network, by doing um, a web search. And some people also go to repositories. Um, so you can see that the what we are interested here in is mostly the left hand way. Uh, because uh, when people already are in the repository, we kind of, you know, we already have them. So we don't need to work so hard um, to to make them uh, be able to find what they're looking for. Um, so what we're looking for here is uh, if people have uh, seen uh, a data set in the literature, or if they have just heard about it through maybe on a conference, or if they just try to Google it somehow, then um, that's what we want to uh, improve. Um, so why don't we use DOIs? Um, the truth is that still only less than 3% use links or DOIs. So, um, the, the link directly from, from literature to data doesn't exist currently. So people are working on that, but, and that would improve a lot, but uh, that's not how it currently works. Um, and, uh, but, but if you, if you tried to Google that name, you will still find it usually. Um, so, um, um, so the idea is to, to streamline that process a little bit. And also, um, how can we support the data discovery within the data uh, repositories is something that we will be doing next year and the year after. And also how will we look at the tools and resources this is also something that we plan to be looking at. But right now we are looking at the left hand side. Okay, so we did an observation study and uh, we asked our 12 participants in the context of your research, you need research data. For today, you decide to start with the search for research data. This is the prompt. And then we just observe without interfering what they're doing. Um, and we, we looked at the, the screens and uh, we also did a semi-structured interview afterwards to uh, interview them about um, their, um, the why of why they did certain things in a certain way. And this is also published. And I think the slides are probably <laughs> um, uh, published also. So you can click on the link then. 
Um, this is uh, the inter interaction diagram that we came up with uh, for, for uh, 10 of the 12 participants. Um, there are different colored boxes for each interaction step that people did. Um, most people, as you can see on the left-hand side, started with Google and um, or Google Scholar and then worked through various um, stages. So um, the box is representing an interaction and can be something between five seconds and 10 minutes. So that's not representative of time. It's uh, representative of how the workflow between those different entities work. Um, so what we can see here is that um, yes, literature is very relevant. So everything that's bluish is literature of some kind. And everything that's orangish is uh, um, something to do with data portals, data repositories, or also additional material. Um, there's another category that we found that was uh, queried quite often, and that are our study and project websites, which we do not really have so much you know, on our agenda, but uh, um, which we now know is are actually quite important as an information source. Uh, we compared that to what other uh, people did. Um, um, where in our study we had 83% who used literature to find data, but uh, in, in surveys 80 or 75% um, said the same thing. So I think we are on, on basically the right track here. Um, and here again, literature search is an important part of uh, data set search. This is um, part of the pre-interview uh, survey that we did. Uh, but there's also other things that people are using um, and also uh, data search is complex. So as I said earlier, um, most people think that, that uh, data set search is difficult. Um, so our most relevant finding from the study is uh, literature search is an important part of data set search. Relevance assessments are uh, typically very complex. We have very, very few downloads there. If you go back to the interactions charts, um, I think there's only four or five downloads there. Uh, and that represents roughly six hours of data search. So this is um, very different than what you would see with the literature uh, search. Uh, we also um, realized that a lot of tools that are maybe known to you because you're, well, in many ways specialists and you know something about the infrastructure, um, but many of those tools, for example, Google data set search or the uh, more general uh, tools were actually unknown. So, so people stick to Google and to literature and to just random web searches, mostly because um, they don't really know where else to go. Uh, what we also saw is a lot of creative misuse, which was very interesting, um, and a lot of um, problems with accessibility and, um, and that a lot of things have to be connected in this ad hoc way uh, simply because these links that you would expect simply aren't there. So you read a paper, they're, they're talking about some sort of data set, but they don't offer a link. Instead, you have to do your own web search to find uh, what you're looking for. Uh, generally speaking, data set literature uh, literacy is very low, and this is self-reported. So this is not something like we looked at them and said, oh, no, you can't do this. But this is something that people um, said um, about themselves. Uh, we also did uh, data findability services. This is a completely different audience. Um, and uh, we sent that out to the participants of uh, Concept SVD. So now we are switching from social scientists uh, to social scientist infrastructure, uh, technical support specialist. Um, we had a pretty good response rate and uh, um, 70 questions. Um, and our first result basically was um, that they were very happy that we were there and uh, willing to help them uh, with their findability issues. Um, and also 88% said, yeah, we do have a, a data repository or website for the data that we present to the public. So this is actually highly relevant for them. Uh, here's some more results. Um, we don't know that the participants take great effort to improve the findability, which is, um, I think, a very good sign that this is um, a topic that is really, um, well, uh, important to a lot of people. Um, one of the most common measures or something like they have open metadata, they have rich documentation, and they use standards, um, and they use keywords, and so on and so forth. 
Um, but when it comes to actually um, user interactions, like user study or even user tracking, um, that's where things get a little bit more um, hazy. That's not something that a lot of people do. Um, yes, but, but still everyone was very interested and wanted to know more about the subject. Um, what we also found is that the available tools that could guide SEO are typically underused. And um, uh, this is also something that we noticed at Jesus where I work, uh, where just three years ago, we just started, well, not exactly in an open space, but, but uh, a lot of the tools that, that we could have used to improve our SEO were just not used. And um, uh, so that, that's when we started. And, um, and we see that this is actually a situation that is pretty common. Um, sitemaps are very vital to communicate which content should be indexed, um, but it's often not known or even, you know, people don't really know, do, they have, do we have a sitemap? What kind of sitemap is it? Uh, or some people just say, I don't know, we don't have that. Um, and also, as with many things, uh, doing SEO without knowing uh, what you're doing and whether something improves or not improves what you're doing is like flying blind. So having a tool is, is very, very vital. And this is actually something that we noticed um, is, uh, is a bit of a problem because a lot of people um, use no tools at all to, to monitor um, their efforts in the direction. Uh, I'm just, you know, hinting that Google Search Console, for example, is completely free of charge and needs no cookie disclaimers, nothing. Uh, there's no problem with, with privacy because you basically just take the data that Google would collect anyway. Um, so that's one of the things that everybody could use. It's really, it's really easy. Uh, and that's also something that I want to point out is that SEO works. Uh, this is an experiment that we did in 2019. Um, we, we started the project. Um, on, on, on a very small, um, I would say, data repository called Jesus Data Search. And uh, we originally had very few impressions. Impressions is basically how often are you shown um, to users. And, uh, and as soon as we started doing relatively minor things, um, these, these, these numbers showed up. Um, so um, yeah, so the, this this type of type of thing actually works. So you will get more users, you will get um, more researchers, and uh, by that you will get more reviews. That's the idea there. Uh, what were the measures that we did? We introduced a sitemap. We corrected lots of errors that we found that Google Search Console was just telling us, oh, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. And, and we fixed it. Uh, we introduced schema.org markup. Um, we uh, made some strategic placement of the term data set, which we before for some reason didn't have. Um, and also the study title, which is, um, as I, I think I'll go into later, um, very vital to, to your search success. Um, but uh, the idea here is that the measures respond to previously identified problems. So basically just look at what's wrong with what we currently have, and then you react to that. And uh, the second that you stop reacting, then or your numbers go down again. Um, a little more detail on what we did. Um, the important part really is to use the monitoring tools. Uh, and, and we've seen that because I, well, we have, lots of different engineers and some were just, oh, we just do schema.org and then they did it. And then I looked at it and there was a missing parenthesis somewhere and everything was basically in vain. And this could be really easily debugged, but, um, but you can just assume that if you didn't check if it worked, then it probably didn't work. So uh, it's very, very important that, that, you, um, that you cross check everything that you do there. Okay, and um, we also did some, some log analysis, uh, which is also published in a uh, lightning talk that we did on the Open Science Fair. And this is also ongoing research. I will get to that a little bit later. And uh, we analyzed uh, what kind of queries would land us at a dataset page. Um, and unsurprisingly, um, it's stuff like datasets, data sets, State Datenbank, so with you know lots of lots of Germans, so German words um, specific to the social science. We have things like question, questionnaire, Scala, 
um, if you have some type of um, um, data. Um, and the other thing that we found is that it's important that you not only have the name or the title of your study, but also the acronym. Uh, this is something that we really found is that, that um, um, in the data we're currently looking at, uh, we have five times as many acronyms as actual names. Um, so acronyms are like super, super important. Please include them in your metadata, otherwise people cannot find your data in that specific way. Um, yeah, so um, the other thing that we discovered is that all the relevant metadata for findability should be both in the title and description, because uh, we saw that a lot of the metadata aggregators um, don't index all the fields. So make sure that everything is uh, in the title and description and other commonly used fields. You can use tools to check what they have indexed, and I encourage you very much to do so. Um, speaking of metadata aggregators, uh, let me go on a quick tangent as to why I should bother. Uh, if my metadata is in all the relevant central indexes, then I should be findable, right? This is something that we hear a lot, uh, and it's not exactly true. Uh, one of the reasons is that they don't really see it as their um, goal to be findable in that particular way. Um, and it's also very hard. So even if they, you know, just one day decided to, yeah, we want that, um, they would run into all kinds of technical problems with that. So, so I don't think it's the current state that, for example, if you just write, if you just Google one data set name, um, it's highly unlikely that uh, data site open air or Google data set search will be your first pick. Um, and so it's probably not a good idea to rely on that for, um, for your findability. Uh, we also know that the surveys that they don't really know, um, researchers don't really know about metadata aggregators, which is of course something that, that has something to do with each other, these both facts. And yeah, so whenever we tested, we saw that the original DOI landing page was ranked highest um, with some exceptions. For example, sometimes study pages are a little higher. So um, individual app pages. Um, and yes, if you know something about how literature works, that works differently. So if you type in the name of a paper, um, you will not find, or it's highly likely that you will not find the original DOI landing page as your first entry, but some metadata aggregator. So this is just, it's a different setup. Okay, um, so this is my last slide and I'm only three minutes over, sorry, Claudia, <laughs> for, for that. Um, so what can you take away from this little talk? Uh, first of all, large proportion of users find data through web search, that's just a fact. Uh, that was a good idea to improve your web visibility and Concept SVD provides guidelines for that. So just ask us and we can tell you. Um, other important factors are literature and word of mouth. So it's also a good idea to be represented there to uh, improve the findability. And uh, the last thing is something that I added just five minutes ago. Uh, we are looking for data donations uh, to help us better understand web queries for research data. So as I just said, we had this we had this thing that we saw that acronyms are actually more uh, likely to be used as queries as as full names. Um, we would actually love to verify that that finding uh, with uh, data from I don't know another domain or whatever you have. So it would be really great if uh, someone would be <laughs> able to to just give us the queries. We can anonymize them any way you like. Um, we just want to have a look at it and, and verify some of our hypothesis on, on, on independent data because right now we are basically working on the three data sets over and over again and so I, I sometimes feel like we're trapped in there a little bit so if you have access to such data or no way to make it access uh, to this uh, data please contact me just write me a quick email or just uh, chat me up here right now or um, uh, later okay so that's my part. Um, I think we will do 10 minutes of Q&A or maybe just seven. And then Claudia will take over. Okay, so we will have like a short Q&A section and a short discussion now and then we continue. Okay, perfect. So are there any questions from the audience at this stage?
otherwise um a short comment from my side um i really like this hands-on mentality you had um with simply starting like to to follow the researchers path uh, how do they uh, do they look for new data sets and simply follow their track and to work with a simple but uh, maybe very powerful uh, mechanisms everybody actually can use so um what i was a bit surprised of that uh, tools are not only unknown but also are misused um could you please elaborate a little bit um on what you mean by uh, the tools are misused and what uh, could derive from this finding Okay, so for example, we had one participant who said, oh, he wants to find a person who writes on a specific data set because he knows a lot of people in the in the community and he wants to find one person who does that. And I, I just, I looked at that request and in, in my head immediately like, super complicated. How are we going to do that? We need like author disambiguation. Uh, but we didn't say so, uh, that person just, um, uh, use the tool that we already had and 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 some control finds mechanisms <laughs> to to basically find the data for himself. And um, I, I thought that was very very interesting because of course uh, our, our our repository was not actually meant um, to to provide information on that subject, but uh, it does surprisingly, which is very nice. So this is one, um, one of the more memorable misuses. Um, also, uh, how people search for variables in data sets that do not offer variable search. Again, there were some very creative ways of doing that. Um, um, and, and for example, with, with um, PDF search and all kinds of things. So PDF search actually was there a lot. Um, and yeah, the, the control F, thing was very, very interesting how people would use that uh, to find structured data where structured data was missing in the, in the infrastructure. So, okay, yeah. thank you. If you want more, more, more examples, please read the paper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Timo Mühlhaus has raised a hand. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I have, I have a question. Um, regarding if you do argument your data with schema.org uh, attributes, do you have a recommendation how deep you should go describing your data with this so that you have a balance between quick findability and 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 the detail level? You understand what I, what I mean? Yeah, I, I understand what you mean completely. Uh, so uh, my advice at the current point in time, which of course might change, is to, to not do it too deeply uh, because we know that that there are not so many um, people who actually use it. So we know that researchers themselves don't use it at all. Um, so the people that you are basically writing to are a good data set search. And, um, and there's also this other thing where, where, where everything that's a data set is basically treated as structured data, uh, which also helps your page rank. Um, so yes, do it. Um, but uh, it's highly unlikely that a human will use the schema.org annotation to, uh, to understand the data. Hmm? To understand the data completely. Yes, yes. So, you, so your recommendation that, would be point. sorry. Your recommendation would be to to use it as a as a starting point to find the complete data set, and then for detailed level you would use something else. Yeah. Yeah, so 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 treat it more like a teaser for the for the for the data and not like the actual description because the the, the what you really need is 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 uh, is a very short text that explains what you have, and that enables people to refine uh, your data set, especially if they're coming from somewhere else, and um, they will have to rely on additional documentation and more thorough metadata. Um, on that hopefully can be found on your website anyway. So this is the, the, the schema.org is basically uh, like, like the, the, um, the calling card that you give people so they know who you are. Um, and and I, I don't think it's, it's used by anyone currently for, for deeper documentation. Yeah. Thanks. 
Okay, so there are two yep. chat messages. I don't have chat open. So. Exactly, there are two uh, chat messages. Uh, just read it out and maybe just a short answer and then we um, continue with the talk. Uh, do you find a problem in your community to support Google search? I mean, some of our colleagues try to avoid Google as a principle, but many colleagues are aware that there is hardly a way to avoid that because people use Google. Um, yeah. So, uh, how do I put this? Um, we, I try to use the word web search as much as possible because when I talk about Google, I actually talk about all kinds of web search. There's also Bing and DuckDuckGo and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think, you know, regardless of everything else, um, there's like ethical concerns, obviously. So I, I do understand the hesitation that a lot of people have the second I use the G word. But it is empirically very, very obvious that it's the biggest player um, in, in, in the game. And um, you will do yourself a, a disservice if you don't use it. Um, that's, that's, that's my stance on it. I mean, it's, it's really, um, I think there's, there's, there's the, the elitist idea of you know not um, um, collaborating um, with the sort of closed shops that that Google represents, and I, I understand that. Uh, but in this case, it's, it's really um, it's uh, I think it's it's not the reality of what we currently live in. That that this is actually important that you that you get represented where the people are, um, and and and. Where, however way I look at it, it, it's clearly where the people are. And so you, you have to find a way to collaborate with that, I think. If, if you want to be findable, if you don't want to be findable, then okay. But if you want to be findable, uh, there's really no, currently no real alternative. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that uh, Claudia Salbach will continue with the talk. So short hand over. Perfect. And then I have to unmute myself first, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, perfect. Hello, everyone. My name is Claudia Salbach, and I am pleased to present our project Open Data Format together with my colleague Chao Yohan. Um, since we are gathered here today from different disciplines, I would like to start by briefly showing you some typical research questions scientists and the social and behavioral, educational and economic sciences deal with. Therefore, I've picked some articles whose headlines illustrate this well. Let's take a look. Typical questions might be, for example, what motives, what are the motives for dropping out from higher education or which unemployment benefit durations are considered fair for which groups? Or what is the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on informal caregiving? Or even how is text messaging linked with higher relationship satisfaction and long distance relationships? So what scientists in our discipline are interested in are things like motives, attitudes, socio-demographic characteristics, uh, the economic or labor market situation or daily behavior. Constructs like these are traditionally collected through surveys, administrative records or experiments. And um, though the data generating process is different, these data sources have one thing in common, namely their structure. The data is organized in a rectangular format as we know it from spreadsheet software. But it is not only about the rectangular format, it is also about the fact that each variable forms a column and each observation forms a row as we can see in this example here on the left side. And this data structure can also be referred to as tidy data. For scientists, especially in the social sciences, tidy data is commonplace. 
And for later discussion, I would appreciate it if I could get some feedback on how it is in your domain, um, what data structures are used there. The statistical software that scientists in our research discipline use to analyze their data is designed for such tidy data. For example, as we can see here at the screenshot from this data data editor, and this editor enables a table view of the data and each variable forms a column and each observation forms a row, as I've um, explained before. So let's take a look at what scientists produce by using the software for answering the questions. And again, um, we have some examples from the articles I've presented before. And not very surprisingly, we have frequency tables, tables uh, with coefficients and standard errors, group bar plots, confidence intervals, and regression lines. And as far as um, scientists do not collect data by themselves, there are several data sources that provide data for reuse. And here we see the research data centers that are part of Consort SVD. And if I'm not wrong, there are up to this point 39 data centers participating from which the majority, majority is disseminating data for quantitative analysis. And those uh, I framed blue here. So we were interested in what data format is provided by these research data centers. And here we see a screenshot from the GESIS data portal and our end is pointing at the data formats that are accessible for the ALBOS survey data, just as an example. And the file formats are SEV and DTA, um, which are formats for the proprietary software SPSS and data, which I'm sure some of you also know well. But what about the other research data centers? And we have analyzed the websites and data portals and the bar plot shows the data formats for the software SPSS and data are dominant. And CSV files, uh, which could be considered an open file format are much less offered. But what about the data users? What software do they use? To answer these among other questions, SOP at DV, DEV runs a regu regular user survey and the results of the latest survey in 2019 show that SOP data are mainly being analyzed with data. And furthermore, SPSS usage seems to flatten out at a low level, whereas the use of R is increasing. But as we all know, users need more than just access to the data. Users need information about the data generating process and about data quality so that they can decide whether the data is suitable to answer the questions, so that they are able to analyze the data correctly as well as for an accurate interpretation of the results. They need assess to metadata like study description, the code book survey instrument, methodological and technical reports. And this kind of metadata is generally also provided by the research data centers, as we can see here for the GESAS data portal example again. Well, and also here, I'm curious um, what your experience is, what metadata is absolutely necessary for researchers in your field. And let's have another look at this data, data editor, and we see that there is already some metadata available, namely information describing the variables and the data set itself. Variable metadata that users definitely need are the variable name and value labels, and these are displayed in the table view here left, as well as in the list view right here. Additional variable information is also available, for example, variable type, uh, format, value label, and some notes. And there's also some information on the data set, like file name path, data set label, number of variables, and number of observations. Though there's already quite a lot of information available via the statistical software. The metadata is not as enriched as it could be. For example, information on methods or instruments is missing. And to find this information, users have to leave the software environment and search for it on the web. And um, what do you think? How important is it for researchers in your domain to have access to metadata directly via the um, working software? So for now, um, we have looked at which data format scientists in our discipline are working with and what their expectations are. Now it might be helpful to discuss the relevance of data format 
formats in the context of the FAIR principles. And at a glance, we can see that the problems are in the area of interoperability and reproducibility. But uh, why is this? Proprietary data formats are not interoperable between different software or even software versions. And this is why research data centers produce different data formats, which is cost intensive. There are software packages that are capable of converting one data format into another, but however, this might be the risk of losing information. And we know that the lack of interoperability makes it difficult to reproduce data. We have also seen that metadata is the basis not only for the analysis of data, but also for its reproducibility. And until now, users have to leave the working environment to search for additional metadata on the web. So, it is our goal to develop a metadata enriched open data format that can be understood by common statistical programs. And on the one hand, this format enables data users to have better access to metadata, namely directly via the statistical software. And furthermore, it also implies that users of different software can work with one and the same data file rather than different uh, data formats. And now I would like to hand over to my colleague, Chao Yohan, who is giving you a little bit more insights about um, our current working process. And Chao the stage is yours. Uh, thanks, uh, Claudia. Uh, next. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next, I'll present the actual work and current results of our project. So from the overall mission of the project, we decomposed the goal into several specific working components. The first task is uh, specification and the documentation of a metadata schema. It is a central work throughout the whole project and starting from an expandable minimum specification and we hope to keep developing it into a well-structured metadata schema. And the second aspect of our work is to develop uh, import filters for commonly used statistical programs so that the specified metadata can be easily used for data analysis. And another uh, technical aspect is to provide a conversion filter with which proprietary data formats can be converted uh, into open data format based on the specified metadata schema. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, for the open data format, we're currently working intensively on the metadata schema on variable level. So we developed our internal data scheme, uh, schema that contains a variable CSV file and a variable category CSV file. We implement um, the metadata to a sample raw data CSV file from SERP panel data. In this way, it will be our uh, preliminary open data uh, format package. Next slide, please. And when we take a further look into this metadata structure, on the top left, it is a sample uh, variable CSV file with, which contains metadata information on the variable level. As you can see, for now, there's uh, several essential description areas uh, for the variables, such as which data set they belong to uh, variable labels and short descriptions. And then we still keep discussing and reaching it uh, in our metadata specification work. For the multilingual feature, we keep it uh, with us at the very beginning. Uh, so we have all um, variables for now, both English and German labels. Below the variable CSV is the variable category file, which contains information uh, of value labels. The function of value label is to indicate the meaning of the code belonging to a specific variable. And on the right side is a sample raw data. These three files form up a, a simple structure, but still contains a basic connections. For example, for the variable um, BAK6 uh, that marked in blue, researchers can consult the variable metadata to know that BAK6 stands for gender and look up into the variable categories as we fail to figure out that number one means male and number two means female in their data set. And except for these basic description areas, we also have 
explored some new features for variable met uh, metadata. For example, the URL column, which is a URL address pointing to a connected variable page in the online metadata portal. In this way, we hope to link the two forms of data publishing and provide end users with more uh, information. Next slide, please. For the user interface in R, uh, this metadata information can be displayed as shown in the screenshot, including variable information together with its value labels and the URL. The URL address uh, is presented as a hyperlink with, which can be directly opened and it can get users to online metadata platform. Next slide, please. The example variable BAK6 has an uh, external web page based on the work that they have already done in the research data center observe, where users can get more illustrative and uh, uh, explanation and its connected uh, variables information. So the scenario will be that the users don't have to consume additional time and leave their working environment to acquire more information for their data. The online metadata platform and other necessary resources will be linked uh, in the data package published by the research data centers. Um, next slide, please. Away from um, specification, we also have done some work in the technical implementation. So based on the metadata schema and the sample data as shown before, it is one of our missions to develop uh, import filters for widely used statistical software so, so that the users can easily import and operate our open data format in their familiar technical environment. Next slide, please. R is one of our main target software. Uh, we have tested some functions such as load the data in R and do some simple operations such as count and generate diagram. So the labeled version of the raw data will also be available for users. And if we keep improving this uh, import features for R, I uh, hope that eventually it will be possible for users to fully utilize the functions embedded in R to operate this uh, data format and conduct analysis smoothly. Next slide, please. As a second import feature, it is now possible in person to read uh, in this metadata schema. After loading the data, the users will be able to query variable information and also value labels for specific variable. They can view the raw data version and also labeled data version. Next slide. Please. As mentioned before, we keep the feature of multilingual language at the variable level in the very beginning uh, of our specification work. So now for the implementation of this uh, multilingual metadata text, it is also possible to um, uh, query the la uh, value label in the desired language and view the different uh, language versions of the data. In our example, there will be three available data versions, the raw data, the English labeled and the German labeled data. Parallel with our import feature, we are also working on the import functions in Python. And we hope these import features will make analysis easier for researchers who use um, this open data format. Next slide, please. In addition to our own metadata schema specification work, we also explore the compatibility with other widely used metadata standards. For example, we have done some mapping work between our internal metadata schema to the DDI codebook and try to export uh, uh, our metadata schema in DDI codebook as XML format. Uh, next slide, please. And this slide uh, gives a more intuitive demonstration and map of our task. So in the center, it is the internal data format. It is where the metadata specification work actually happens. And based on this specification, we test the import functions for the different statistical programs on the right side. The software that we currently unplan are uh, Stata, R, and Python. And after the preliminary development of metadata schema and import feature, we then uh, explore the possibility to export our metadata schema to different um, 
metadata standards such as DDF families and provide conversion feature for our uh, metadata structure. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, so far is our introduction to the project and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Since we know that there is a wide spectrum of audience working in different scientific domains, we were also curious about what statistical software you're using in your field for data collection and analysis. And have you uh, encountered with problem uh, with uh, propriety software? Please feel free to share your experience and bring up your questions if, for our project. Thanks. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk, uh, Claudia Salbering, Xiaoyao Yihan. Um, and thank you for already asking uh, questions to the audience. So I'm really very much looking forward to uh, today's discussion. And are there already some answers, comments uh, on the questions which were raised by the presenters? Of course, you can also uh, ask a question <laughs> or give other comments. Um, so I see a hand raised by Thorsten Trippel. Um, so you, one of the questions you asked was um, if you, uh, if we need to have access or if our users need to have access directly to the metadata. And we found out in our context that some of our uh, users are actually providing services or tools. And uh, at least for those services, uh, they need full access to the metadata. They download the metadata, for example, to distinguish or to determine um, a, a, a tool that uh, can operate on the given data set. So they analyze the data on the fly uh, based on the metadata to see um, uh, which tool would fit uh, the purpose. So that would be one of my answers. <laughs> Are there more comments and answers from other fields of research? Again, you can raise a hand or type down a cue or your comment. Um, so there's a question which was typed down in the chat. Um, I just read it out. Interesting to see the different codes, minus six to minus one for missing data of various kinds. Are there any drives to standardize those in your field of research? I will just hand it over back to you, Mr. Um, Alba. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure if I've understood the question right, but Software handles missing uh, values differently. So this is one problem we'll have to look into and find a solution that works for all software programs. Okay, so it's not only like a problem of standardization within your field of research, but it's uh, connected to all software which is used. So. It's a standardization problem <laughs> across fields of research, which makes it more fun to work on. <laughs> and Thorsten Trippel, is the hand still raised or is it a new comment you want to make? Sorry, I didn't lower my hand. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, are there more questions or answers? I don't see more comments at the moment. So um, thank you again for your very interesting talk, um, highlighting very um, um, 
a problem which is shared like by all fields of research and by pointing out how you are working basically on all these obstacles and problems and how you um, step by step improve metadata and data findability. And um, so I think we can now come to an end, uh, but I want, uh, would like to um, draw the attention to the next um, infra talk, which is already at, um, on taking place on 7th of February at 4 p.m., uh, this time with NFDI for Health. And this is also uh, because uh, the infra talks have been very successful in 2021 and the spots filled up very fast uh, last year. And this is why we decided to have a higher frequency in 2022. Um, so now you will have the opportunity to join the talks uh, bi-weekly and uh, we We'll be very happy to see you again and uh, to share um, discussion and comments uh, with you in two weeks.